I've got here a multi-stem tree. This is a multi-stem Pittosporum tubera, and amazingly it will go up to 30 foot. Now I got this in as a bush and I just planted it in the ground elsewhere so you can just see how small and insignificant it looks in the ground compared to when you elevate it in a pot. And I've elevated it in this baseless pot to give it more prominence. It's by my entrance. I see it every day and I love it. And this whole video is about multi-stem trees. So I'm gonna change this shrub into a multi-stemmed tree. And I love multi-stems and they're very fashionable. If you go to Chelsea, you'll see a load of people using multi-stem trees. And I think the reason they're so popular is they're much smaller in scale generally, um, because you can manage them and you can keep them contained. So although this could grow up to 30 foot um, in, in really favourable conditions, you could always clip it to keep it at the height you want. Because if you haven't got a massive building or in a small entrance like this, I don't want anything too overpowering. Um, so I can just remove bits from the side like this so that you can walk by it without interfering with the foliage. You can lift the canopy right up in bigger specimens as it gets bigger so you walk under it. So basically they're very flexible. Most trees that you can make into multi-stem are usually trees that are used for hedging because that means that they will grow back. So when I'm working on a house and it's got some bits of elevation that I don't think are particularly attractive or it's got many different types of elevation, if you put a series of the same tree in front of the house or in a courtyard beside the house, then you're giving it some unity and you're pulling all the different architectural items will have more will cling together better somehow and you have a lot of greenery at eye level and that's where you really notice it so it distracts your eye from perhaps the not so nice architecture behind it um, and also when you've got foundations and you're planting trees close to buildings if you have something that's going to be a whopper it could affect the structural stability of the house because it takes moisture away from the soil and the foundations can move a bit particularly on shrinkable clay by a house you don't want anything too massive or it just dominates the house too much so this is one tree that I've got here, this Pittosporum. Beautiful white fragrant flowers in sort of May, June that last for a good month. I sometimes use it as a hedge. It's a lovely hedging plant. It clips really well, um, hence ideal for a multi-stem too. Um, it's very drought resistant. So in a pot, it's good. I mean, this has no base, so it doesn't really make any difference because once I've watered, I'll probably water it for, for it's now um, April, I'll probably water it until about June, July, and then only when it's really dry. And I'll just water it maybe once a week in dry times with a lot of water. So the water runs down into the ground below and the roots will chase it down. I want the roots to get out of the pot where I know they are and right into the ground so it's self-supporting and I won't bother to feed it. Um, after then it will get its own nutrients and if you want more information on baseless pots have a look at my baseless pots video um, but I find it an invaluable way to bring greenery close to a building green, bring it up to eye level and have it of a manageable size so this is my pit of sport. and when you're doing something like that you need to step back and look at it all the time otherwise you can go too far um, it's got some scraggy bits on it hasn't it I just see round to the side so I'm just going to take these scraggy bits off and I will just regularly do this I don't know once a year or something I might give it a bit of a touch up um, take off the little bits because I just want to show the lovely stem lines the lovely multi-stem stem lines without the leaves interfering and then next door I've got Mark II, which I haven't done any pruning to, so we'll just quickly go and lift the canopy of that. I've got my secateurs for the little bits. I've got my favourites um, for the chunkier ones. And then I've got my safety goggles and my very famous gizmo, which is this, which is brilliant for the ones up to 75 millimetres, and you'll see it'll whip through them in seconds. So you see this one is furnished right the way down. Um, so I'm just going to quickly lift these off. Now I'm doing this in April, but to be honest, um, these ones aren't going to flower anyway, so I'm not stopping the ones flowering in May later on. Obviously, if you had birds nesting in it, you wouldn't do it, but I think it's an unlikely that it's going to nest in this at the moment. 
that's a little one so I'm going to take that off with a bigger shoot in fact this has got a lot more little ones on so I'm going to take all these little ones off at ground level and if it if more grow more little whippy shoots water shoots as they're called then you just sort of pull them off or pinch them off and they'll go but I want to have a just a bowl system of maybe I mean you could have anything with a multi-stem anything from two to six branches or something like that as many as you like really I think a very fashionable one are birch trees people love multi-stem birch um, I've, I've just seen too many of them I think although at Oswestry we use the river birch uh, with a slightly sort of more cinnamony colour um, bark and they are lovely and they are not in pots they're just in the ground um, they like quite moist soil which they get in Oswestry. What you can do if you're impatient and you don't want to spend the money on a big specimen is you can actually just get three small feathered birch or standard birch and just put them in the same hole as it were and then it gives you the effect you've actually got. Now these are two very close together and take that big one out. It also was a bit one-sided I think because it's close to the hedge so I'm going to take that out a bit as well but um, I'm now going to go down to something smaller to take those whiffier bits off but you can see we're going to denude a fair chunk of this poor tree but it doesn't actually mind well I say that but it, it won't affect its growth it will just give more energy to the rest of the tree really um, so it will grow more, be in a more concentrated form, I find. Now, because it's been moved at quite a big size, it has a bit of a shock. And sometimes people do that when they move trees. It is quite good to reduce the canopy because then it helps the root to shoot ratio. So the roots will be slightly reduced because it's been moved. So if you reduce the canopy, then obviously it's a better balance and it's healthier. Um, so these are going right into the head, so I cut these back. Um, and then when we've done this one, I'm going to show you the next tree just along, which was just a laurel bush, which I put in to hide the um, gas canisters that were previously on the wall. So here it is, so this was a little shrub, there was some oil tanks, gas tanks on the wall there and I put the shrub in to screen the gas tanks, then they went and so we lifted the canopy and so it's basically a shrub but you see the size of these branches now and you can see that two of them that were growing close together have actually grafted into each other there at the back I think and they formed together and they formed a graft, so they are now as one. Um, and you can see you do get odd bits of leaf, foliage and branches coming up at the base again, because it's a hedging plant, it naturally wants to regenerate. So maybe once a year, I'll clip a few of those off. But it's a lovely big tree. It's probably got a bit too big now. It's giving too much shade to the window. So I think we're gonna come in and lift the canopy above the windows and maybe reduce the top a bit but they're a sturdy hedging plant. These Portuguese laurel, they love the drought, the shade, the sun, anything you throw at it, they seem to thrive. So these are my cork oaks. I put them on the en outside entrance to the courtyard, again in baseless pots. And cork oaks, uh, you think of Mediterranean, you think of Portugal, you know, they use the bark to make the corks, or they used to before plastic closures came in on wine bottles. And I'm amazed how hardy these are. And some people think that these will sort of take over with climatic war warming. These will become much more common. And they've, they've withstand frosts of minus 14, 15 quite happily. Now you can see these are very twiggy. So I just need to take a few more off the base. These have grown extraordinarily since I put them in. I'm now removing the lower canopy a bit, just tidying it up. Um, but there is one big branch which is going right up the roof and so that um, I'm going to actually take off with the bigger saw but you see that just means you see this lovely trunk like that it's really really does 
make it come into its own. So, um, I mean, I've used pleached, we've made pleached cork oaks on, or used them on jobs in London, uh, particularly where it's obviously very mild, but it, I think I could use them in the East Midlands quite happily. I think they'd be hardy enough. Um, I've used them in jobs in Oxfordshire. If, say, these got too big, I could prune them higher up or I could take out a whole limb that was too big and just let another one shoot come up from the base to replace it. So you can really manipulate the height of them. Now this is one tree I won't feed to the cattle because oaks can be quite nasty for cattle apparently I hadn't realized so I, I give my hornbeam to the cattle um, but I just don't give my oaks so there we are so that looks better and that will fill out trees have this capacity when there's a gap they'll fill back in there um, so that looks a lot better I'm very proud of these. I planted these as little bushy liners about this big. And initially we had them as big balls on the corners. I've got 14 of them. Then I thought, well, I want to give the hedge some light underneath. And so I've lifted them. So I just lifted off all the bits and you can see there's still a few scratchy bits left. But, um, and they, they, when I first did it, I did have the odd gap, but now they've um, filled in really. And I mean, you can buy them from nurseries, do do instant multi-stem box. They do them this height, they do bigger ones, but they cost a fortune. And so when you actually make your own, it's much more satisfying. And it's quite nice when you grow up with something, having seen it from a rooted liner all the way up to something like this. What these box really add is green impact throughout the year. So we've got the, qu uh, the quince trees here, which beautiful, just coming into leaf now, look magnificent. But the winter picture, which obviously we view from all the elevations of the house that overlook this, you see it when you come into the courtyard. I love having this permanent bit of green structure that's a bit quirky and I think it, uh, it is a real asset. So here is my Filaria, Filaria latifolia, the green olive. It's a lovely plant. I found it totally hardy. I think when people buy them in at a large size, they sometimes lose them. Um, but these, having grown from small, uh, survived minus 17 degrees centigrade quite, quite happily. Now, these are remnants. They've left here from ones that I've grown on. So I'm not quite sure what I'm doing with them. But I think to get more light in and to see through to the field beyond, I think I'm going to lift the canopy. I'm going to take some of the major limbs out and then in time, I might well trim the top to, to keep it lower so it doesn't get too big. So I'm just going to take a few of these biggies off down below. I'm not going to finish the job or you'll be bored stiff. This one's a bit closer. I'm going to take it out. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't need to do that. <laughs> and so, it, and it goes on and then I'll remove all these lower layer. It's work in progress. But it's lovely to have a tree this size that will actually make quite an impact this summer um, and will change the character of the beast and um, it will add quite a lot to the corner of my lovely vegetable garden. I'm just going to show you a couple more specimens. One is a hawthorn and it was a little seedling that I dug up from somewhere in the garden and I put in the, the little light woodland area. And now it's naturally grown into a multi-stem. Have a look at it and see what you think of it. I think it's a beautiful little tree. And then I'm also going to show you um, another one which I inherited, which I also adore. This is one of my favorite trees in the garden. So I lifted it as a tiny transplant and I popped it here and I didn't put a tree guard around it or anything. And so I think what happened is actually the rabbit nibbled it and rabbits will nibble hedges, but um, actually they then sprout back because they naturally want to regenerate. And so what's happened is it's come back with two stems and I think it's a really pretty tree. I'm not going to raise the canopy to expose the stems because it's just nice to have it as this with the limbs going down to the ground. Now, generally, 
trees have these limbs going down to the ground and as they get older they lose them they just naturally drop them off um, but um, sometimes with hawthorn we had some in the field that they just kept staying down to the ground and they were really beautiful trees that you could actually go inside and um, with lovely horizontal branches so here you can see the double stem so a much younger shoot has shot up because the, the older main trunk obviously got bent or twisted and so that one had its apical dominance and shot up very straight if you remember, you might have seen the videos showing this with the hazel walkway with massive big hazels over the top, multi-stemmed. Now they, as I said, naturally will grow with many branches. I've cut them right back. When they were big, they were probably four or five metres tall, I would think. They will have had a massive root system. Then you cut them and the root dies back accordingly in proportion to what is left. So they will grow and they will grow rapidly because the roots are well established. Um, but it does mean to say that their root system has been reduced. Now this is useful to know because when you're planting a hedge near a building and you're restricting the size of it, you're not letting the roots get too big and interfere with the foundations of the house potentially. The same with pleached trees, if they're near a building, if you're cutting the top of the pleaching, the roots aren't going to get so big and invasive towards any buildings. Um, and the same with multi-stem trees. So when you're cutting them and controlling them, you're also, although you're only cutting the top, you are effectively controlling the roots down below to some extent as well. So that is useful in terms of plants you've got surrounding it, won't be in such competition, and foundations of buildings or walls or things like that. So this tree, Catinus cogigara, was in the garden when we came. It was the only tree here. Um, and it is a shrub normally, it's a little garden shrub, but this is probably six metres tall. It's one of the biggest I've ever seen. And it is, I would call it a multi-stem tree, not a shrub now because of its proportion. It's looking at its worst now, um, but I love it because it has amazing um, autumn colour foliage. It has lovely flowers that look like smoke because they're so sort of fluffy looking, so it's the smoke bush. Um, and I like the fact that it's quite quirky in an otherwise quite formal setting. Now, this is weird. It drops big limbs off. Maybe every few years, it'll lose a massive limb and then another one grows up. But it, it doesn't seem to mind. It carries on growing um, and it doesn't seem to harm it. So I do very little to it. I just enjoy it. So these are the last two multi-stems I'm going to show you for today. Um, and these are two of my favourites. Magnolia cross lobneri, which is a magnolia that is very, very durable with respect to frost, because we've had some pretty hard frost, but the flowers are totally unaffected. And I also love it because it doesn't mind limey soils. And we've got pH 8, which is quite limey, and the magnolia thrives. Um, it's going quite big, so I might, um, in a year or so, remove one of these stems, I think, because perhaps it's going too big. And it is growing beside its mate, which is a holly, which is also a multi-stem. Here you can see the holly with the two definite trunks, but this is pruned into a sort of niwaki type shape, and it just serves to hide the view out from the window in the building behind, so we don't look into their window and they don't look into our garden. So just to round it up, um, we've got lots of multi-stem trees here. I'm continually making new ones, but you can be really adventurous with multi-stems. You can do Amelanchia lamarckia, that's a very popular multi-stem. Crab apples are brilliant. Um, Judas trees, I think, can be multi-stemmed. Common ones are things like oak, which people used to coppice in the olden days for timber, and they do very well, and that way you can contain them at a smaller size. Hawthorns, as we've mentioned. So really many, many trees, but if you want to play safe, then any tree you use for hedging is brilliant to make a multi-stem. <laughs>